Hello everyone, I'm Daz and welcome to American Civil War and UK History Podcast. This presentation is available as a video on our YouTube channel or as a podcast from wherever you get your podcasts from. And remember, if you're watching on YouTube, to hit the subscribe button and give us a big thumbs up. And to keep up to date with everything American Civil War and UK History, check out our website where you'll find blog posts, podcasts and links to all of our social media pages and the link is in the podcast description. And joining me today is... Deputy Director of Education at the American Battlefield Trust, Chris White. Welcome, Chris. Dan, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Cheers. And today's discussion is about the battle and siege of Mobile Bay. Mobile Bay is, um, and Mobile the city, is, is one of my favorite places to visit in the Deep South. It sits, Mobile, it sits on a natural harbor. Um, and that harbor is uh, was first found by Europeans around 1534. Um, the Spanish come here first, and then the French will later on really um, uh, come into this area, and they're going to help to settle Mobile, Biloxi, go out to New Orleans. And it's really two brothers, the Lemoyne brothers, Bienville and Iberville, who come into this area and really turn this into um, a portion for the Kingdom of France. Um, their neighbors would have been uh, Bourbon, Spain, and this whole area is the natural drainage for what becomes the state of Alabama. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, but if you come down to Mobile, there are four major rivers that drain into Mobile, creating Mobile Bay. So you'll have the Mobile River, you have the Dog River down here, um, the Tensaw River, which has a massive, uh, which has a massive delta that's about. Um, uh, 10 miles by 40 miles, and then it also has uh, 260 or so thousand acres of that. That delta is the largest delta in Alabama. And then, of course, you have Mobile Bay, which is just an absolutely huge body of water with more than 20,000 miles of navigable uh, waterways there. Um, and I think that's something that most people don't understand. That Mobile is kind of at the top of this, uh, at the top of the bay, and the, from Mobile today, down to um, uh, down to Dauphin Island and down to where the battle took place there at the mouth of the bay, it's about 32 miles as the crow flies. And then if you come up into um, if you come up into the bay itself, uh, there's ways to go through what's called Grants Pass or over to Bon Secure, which is a um, which means safe harbor. It's very wide, but then it becomes a little bit more more narrow as you get towards Fairpoint um, and Mont Saint Louis, which is about 10 miles across, so narrow is, is a uh, relative term. Um, so it's a huge body of water. And then to add to it, there are a number of barrier islands that help to, to give this a natural barrier. But the, the French are really the first ones who settle here. After they settle, they'll settle up at a place called 27 Mile Point, which is north of, of modern day Mobile. Not a great place to, to settle. Then they'll move about 10 miles downstream down the Mobile River, establish the um, the, the first French settlement there, they'll put in a, a fort, which will change names a few times, Fort Condé, Fort Charlotte. Um, and then over time, the city's going to grow. We're going to see um, the institution of slavery coming here around 1719. We will see the um, French turn over the land to the Spanish and then to the British. And then eventually the Spanish will turn that over to the Americans. Um, and this is a city that's under six flags whenever you you put it all together um, by the end. So Mobile, and the, the this is what Mobile would look like at the time of the American Civil War. This is uh, Edward Canby's map, who's a Union commander um, in the Deep South. But in 1860, uh, Alabama, I'm sorry, Mobile, Alabama, is going to be the fourth largest city in the Confederacy. It has a population of about 30,000 people. Um, 21, 22,000 white, about uh, seven to 8,000 black. And a lot of uh, commerce is going to come through here. About $3.7 million worth of commerce will come in and out of the city of Mobile. Um, there are 13 consulates at the time of the American Civil War, four daily newspapers. Uh, there's no daily newspapers today in Mobile. Um, they had uh, a number of churches, an imposing hotel known as the Battle House. According to some of my friends in Mobile, uh, the Battle House is where Andrew Jackson planned a battle, and there's some other things. Reality of the situation, the Battle House Hotel is uh, named after John Battle, who built the hotel. Uh, but it will survive the American Civil War, burned down in the early 20th century. It's rebuilt, still there today. But its most notable um, 
its most mot- notable person to stay there during the time of the American Civil War, probably to most Americans, would be Stephen Douglas. Uh, Mobile County is where he is going to spend the night before the presidential election of 1860, and he'll spend that night in the Battle House. His campaign manager in Alabama, a guy named John Forsythe, um, who ran one of those Alabama newspapers, will invite him down here to Mobile. Mobile County actually goes for, for Stephen Douglas, one of the few counties he wins in the South. But this is, it's a bustling trade coming in and out of Mobile. Um, by 1861, when the American Civil War starts, the um, uh, the problem that we were going to have in Mobile, and we're going to have this in Alabama in general, is the fact that not everyone's buying into this war. Um, some people want a war uh, for the Confederacy to become its own independent country. Others don't really care. Some want to stay within the Union. And one of the problems that Mobile is going to have early on in this war Um, There are three major cities along the Gulf Coast. To the east, today along I-10, about an hour away by a car, is Pensacola. Then, if you go to the west, about two hours down I-10, there's New Orleans, um, which does not sit at the mouth of the Gulf of Mexico, which sits at the bottom of of Mobile. Um, It sits about 67 uh, to 70 miles north of the Gulf of Mexico, up along the Mississippi River, New Orleans does. You have the problem that Mobile is an export city that is mostly sending cotton out to the rest of the world. And in where you're you're, uh, from, Darren, there's a glut of cotton in the early 1860s, so things aren't flowing out as much as they should. Then the Confederates will put in a uh, self-imposed embargo, and then by the time they want to start shipping things out, the East and West uh, Gulf blockading squadrons have taken hold and are blocking the blockade runners from coming in and out food source or supplies and most of that food comes over from new orleans uh, which is great until april of 62 whenever new orleans falls to the federals and then there's going to be a problem there and um to to close off my long diatribe about mobile and alabama and the civil war a, a lot of people really think that the deep south just wants to go off to war that's the lost cause scenario that that everybody was all in and that's true in South Carolina. Their delegates are, are all about um, going off to war, but that's not the case in Alabama. Um, in fact, in Alabama, uh, in 1861, only about 25% of the um, population, the male population that is eligible for Confederate service goes off to fight in the war. Their governor, Andrew Moore, at the beginning of the war is, uh, after Lincoln's election, going to start seizing federal forts that we're going to talk about, places like Fort Gaines, Fort Morgan. He's going to march troops down to the Florida border, um, which is uh, not too far from Mobile and creating basically acts of war before the Civil War starts. Um, He's all in, but Mobile's not that way. Neither is Alabama. Um, There is a call for secession and there is a, a vote, a general vote to elect delegates. And that election for those delegates only brings out 54% of the population who's eligible to vote. So it's by no means everybody's coming out to say, yes, let's get behind it. And of the, the secession candidate or secession delegates who are uh, brought to Montgomery eventually to vote for or against secession, 61 of them vote for secession and 39 vote against. So it's not at all a uh, let's all get in behind this. And then because these guys aren't all getting in behind it. They decide to have a second election uh, to try to say, hey, should we come in or out? Because we're, we don't really have that the backing of the people. And during the second election, it's even closer where 53 of the delegates for secession vote for and 46 vote against. And Governor Moore is going to call to the new Confederate President Jefferson Davis and say, hey, you got to do something. If you start a war now, Somewhere in Pensacola, because there's a federal fort there that's under the command of a guy named and, uh, Adam Slemmer, or start a, f- uh, a fight up at a place called Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina, that will bring the people of Alabama together. And that's not the case either. After the fire got Fort Sumter in the start of the war, up in the north central part of the state, uh, there's a meeting on July 4th, 1861, uh, at a place called Looney's Tavern. And these guys come together, these people come together, and they say, you know what? We don't want to fight for the Confederacy. We don't fight, want to fight for the federal government. We want to be Switzerland. We want to just pull out of this war and let y'all do what you want to do. And uh, that doesn't go over well. And things are going to keep snowballing. 
Uh, there'll be this thing called the Sequestration Act. Sequestration Act. It's hard to say for me. Um, and uh, anyone who's backing Northerners uh, or the Northern cause, they can have their property taken by the state of Alabama. And that happens. Millions of dollars of property is confiscated. In Mobile, there's a guy who flies an American flag for the entire entirety of the war. He's not in for the war. Um, and if you want to get out of the Confederacy and not either have to fight for the Confederacy or the, or the Union, you can go to New Orleans after it falls to the Union in 1862 or do the same thing in Pensacola in 1862. North Alabama is not all in for this war. And, Mobi and in Mobile, people are behind it to a point, but it's not like this rah, rah, let's, let's fight for the Confederacy. But they are convinced in 1861 that Mobile, because it's the fourth largest city in the state, I'm sorry, in the Confederacy, and it's the largest port in Alabama, that it will be attacked almost immediately. That's not going to be the case. It really doesn't come under federal attack until late summer of 1864. Okay, thanks for that, mate. Cheers. And uh, we're going to move on to the forts, the, so three of the forts that you mentioned there. I know there was a lot more forts in the area. Of course, there is. And then forts go back a long way, don't they? So if could you give us a little bit of um, background history on the forts themselves before the Civil War? Is that possible? Yeah, so this is a, a sketch, and it's one of my favorite sketches. I, I'd like to collect historical maps. This is one of, that is uh, called Fort Morgan. This will eventually be out on a place called Mobile Point. So at the bottom of Mobile Bay, before you break out into the Gulf of Mexico, there are a few barrier islands. Uh, one island to the east is going to be uh, Gulf Shores, also known as Mobile Point. And that is going to be the location of this fort, and that is uh, a Fort Morgan, named after the uh, Revolutionary War hero Daniel Morgan. And if you notice at the top of the map, which is interesting to me, it says United States of America, Louisiana State. So at this point, Alabama is not a state. Um, and we've just acquired uh, roughly a decade prior, a little bit more than a decade prior from France, Louisiana Purchase. Um, and there is still some debate on who owns what between the U.S. and Spain. And basically, this part of Alabama was just kind of taken away from Spain. Um, they didn't consider it part of Louisiana Purchase. So as the War of 1812 taught the Americans uh, they need to fortify their harbors and their shores. And there was a fort here, Fort Bowery, and during the American uh, War of 1812, sorry, during the War of 1812, and it was attacked by the British. Um, this is part of the Deep South campaign that takes place in 1814, early 1815. Um, and that is going to um, kind of be the, 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 the onus for, uh, and, uh, and this precedent to set up fortifications around Mobile. So they'll set this one up. It's a five bastion fort, Fort Morgan. It's a masonry fort. It will have water batteries out on the water, which come into play during the American Civil War. It has a lighthouse eventually. Um, it's going to take a long time to build this thing. But inside the center, which is uh, interesting, is there's a cistern, a central cistern, because you're out on a barrier island. And what people don't realize is you're going to have to collect rainwater uh, because it's hard to get fresh water. Um, I know along the Gulf Coast at this time, sand fleas are a real problem sand blindness because it's so white down there the sands are so white and during this uh, during the summer season that you could get blinded by the sun that's an issue um they have this big cistern but in the middle or uh, but what the cistern sits in the middle of is a huge citadel and that is what most people think fort morgan consists of because of the famous after action pictures that were taken uh, by u.s photographers they show this really interesting fortification inside of Fort Morgan, and they forget about the out, outer bastions. Um, and like anything else, there are hotshot furnaces here. Um, there's going to be a sally port. They will have um, a glacier leading up to it, a scarp, counter scarp. Um, and by the time of the American Civil War, this, this fort's not really heavily manned. When the state of Alabama takes this from the federal government, um, it's going to eventually be manned by uh, be house about 26 cannons inside of it and somewhere between 400 and 600 men at any one point. Um, so this is one part of Mobile Bay's defenses. This is going to be the eastern side of Mobile Bay's mouth. Across the bay is um, a place called Dauphin Island. When it was first, when it was first settled, uh, the French called it Massacre Island. And then they couldn't realize why, they, they didn't figure out why nobody wanted to come to Massacre Island to settle. 
um, there wasn't actually a massacre there. They just found some bones that were most likely Native Americans who had, had skinned animals. Um, but fast forward, they call this Dauphin Island, uh, and Dauphin Island sits to the west of Fort Morgan. Uh, as the crow flies, it's just under four miles today. And Fort Gaines is named after a War of 1812 um, General Edmund Pendleton Gaines. It, too, has five bastions within the fort. It is not the star-shaped uh, Vobanian fort that you normally see. And it sits at the tip of, the, of um, Dauphin Island in an area that is susceptible to flooding. Um, it's not well positioned. In fact, it's going to take a long time to build this fort because of the flooding. They run out of funding at one point. There's a fight over taxation of this land, ironically, um, be, of who owns it because, uh, and then who was paying taxes on it. So for about five years, there's no work done. So by the time of the American Civil War, this fort is, is basically finished, but it's not outfitted with modern artillery. And that means that the purpose of having Fort Morgan on one side of the bay and Fort Gaines on the other side is to have interlocking fields of fire where if ships come into the up the main channel, which is closer to Fort Morgan, they can be hit from two different sides. Um, a great example of this is, is San Francisco Bay. Whenever San Francisco Bay is laid out, there are a number of fortifications, including the famous Alcatraz, uh, which is today a prison, but they connected interlocking connected fields of fire. That was the idea. Never comes to fruition here in Mobile Bay, even though they have these forts, they just don't have the range to actually um, give mutual supporting fire. Okay, cool. And this, I think, is a picture of uh, Fort Powell by, I uh, well, I think it might be, I don't know. I <laughs> so, so Fort Powell's the, kind of the forgotten fort. There are many yeah. fortifications around Mobile. Um, they go up the Baldwin County side, the Mobile County side. Um, my friend Mike Bunn runs the, the Fort Blakely, which is a fantastic site. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Spanish Fort, Paul Bresky, um, another one of my friends, he's, he's really big on on Spanish Fort and has a new book coming out about that. There's fortifications around the city. Then there's Fort Powell, which sits in the middle of what's called Grant's Pass. It's not named after after uh, Ulysses S. Grant. And today, uh, it essentially sits underneath the I-98 bridge, or I'm sorry, the 198 bridge leaving, leading south from Mont San Luis down to uh, uh, Dauphin Island East. And um, Fort Powell is overseen... Um, it's a it's a smaller fort has about 18 guns about 140 men during the time of the battle uh today the intercoastal waterway runs up through here but what it's supposed to do is there are two barrier islands at the mouth of the bay and then as you come up towards the mainland what this is supposed to do is block any incursions from the uh, from the u.s navy coming in amongst the barrier islands from the west. Uh, so it is supposed to block between the mainland, essentially, as well as Dauphin Island, and sit there and be that blocking um, fortification. There's also obstructions in the water along here, basically big pillars and things, and the Confederates are utilizing naval mines at the time. They call them torpedoes at the mouth of the bay. Thanks for that. And uh, I, I know you touched on uh, secession there and why Alabama seceded. Uh, do you, it was an underlying issue why people were reluctant to, like you said, was the amount of, um, you know, um, trade that was going on being a, you know, being so, you know, being a port and everything like that. Is that why they were more reluctant to secede? Yeah, you have a, a large influx of, uh, Yankees, actually, too. Um, one one reason is is the fact of the trade. Um, the the people in Mobile, you know, essentially want their commerce as well as their slaves to be left alone by the government. Um, but they're not not all of them are willing to go to war for this. Some are absolutely. Um, and and some people call this a rich man's war, poor man's fight. But in Alabama, it's definitely not that way. A lot of the rich um, plantation owners uh, uh, go off to war early. And, and serve throughout the war. Um, so you also have Yankees who come in here and settle places like Blakely. Josiah Blakely establishes what he hopes to be a rival city across Mobile Bay from Mobile. And today it's a, it, it's a defunct town. It's a ghost town. But it once was the, the um, county seat of Baldwin County across from, from uh, uh, Mobile. Uh, you also have pockets of people who really want to be left alone up in north georgia there's a lot of unionists and then you have to remember 
um, that whenever the Union Army and Navy make incursions into the South, there will be um, freeing of slaves throughout different different places. So you'll have anywhere between eight to 10,000 people serve uh, from Alabama for the U.S. Army or Navy. Um, and a large portion of them will be United States colored troops who come out. So it's a very complex society down in, in uh, Mobile specifically. And, you know, to say that, that people are not invested in the war would be unfair, but it really is a interesting. It, it's an imp, interesting melting pot. Uh, you have this trade that's now been cut off. Um, so people aren't really happy about that. There's a self-imposed cotton embargo. People aren't really happy about that. But what they really don't like is the fact that the food prices are going up. And as the food prices are going up, because the trade is not coming in from New Orleans anymore, smuggling becomes a problem. There's a famous story of a guy who would smuggle in goods from the Union lines into Confederate lines. And the Confederates put up uh, a number of laws or in install a number of laws where you can't stockpile food you can't pri raise prices on people um but this one guy keeps going back and forth to new orleans and every time he comes back he comes back with a dead relative uh in a casket the reality is he's smuggling things in the casket on his fourth trip he became a little bit uh he became a little bit too big for his britches and uh put the name john Shote on the side of his on the side of it, the casket uh, saying that that's who's inside of the casket. Well, one of the Confederate soldiers knows that shote means pig and uh, opened up the casket and turns out it was full of bacon. Uh, so that was uh, one way he was he was busted. So you have these people who now have to pay. They were paying, um, I think, $49, $45 barrel for flour in 1861. And by 1864, they're paying more than $400 a barrel for flour. Um, molasses is going through the roof. Butter's going through the roof. All of these daily goods are going through the roof. So Pensacola's just down the road. It's now under Union occupation. New Orleans is down the road. It's under Union occupation. So you have these little oasis for unionists or people who are against the confederacy and who don't aren't for the union they can just go hide there and then you have these other underlying issues of you know baldwin county votes for one person whereas mobile county votes for another one stephen douglas um so over time alabama ironically has the first capital of the confederacy but it's a state that's really split and uh to because we haven't even got to the Battle of Mobile Bay, um, I, I, I'll just say one other thing. During the war, desertion is such a problem in Alabama that the Confederates have to deploy brigades of, of infantry into the state and flush them, flush out these deserters. They'll send one brigade in one direction from the south, one from the north, and then try to flush them out like they're having a, a rabbit hunt uh, or a quail hunt and try to recapture these guys. So they're taking forces off the table to deal with, with them. So there's a lot of social issues at, at play here, political issues, and then just people who, who you know, are what we call cooperationists. Um, and that doesn't mean they want to cooperate with the Union. You have these people who wanted to wait to secede when Virginia, North Carolina, uh, Kentucky, and others would secede, whereas the hotheads in places like South Carolina – Alabama, Mississippi just said, let's go, let's, let's go off to war. These other people wanted to have a plan. Um, so there's a lot of infighting that'll take place um, uh, between how to operate this war. Should I be part of this war? And uh, should I just go back to the union or just have everyone leave me the heck alone? Yeah. Excellent points. And this is what people don't think about. You know, there's a lot of things that go on in war. Um, I want to bring you back as well to the blockade runners, because as you said, you know, they're not getting anything. Now, some of these guys, they are getting through, aren't they? Because like I said, you can't go to Petscola, you can't go to New Orleans. So they've got to go somewhere. And of course, they do get through the blockades, don't they? So what is coming into Mobile at the time from the blockade runners themselves? I mean, the blockade runners are bringing in not enough of anything. Um, you have to remember, Rhett Butler is a perfect example uh, of what a blockade runner is. Um, you know, if you look at Gone with the Wind, this is somebody who's profits, profiting from the war. Um, you get a handful of ships in and out of Mobile Bay. Um, you get a handful of ships in and out of Charleston, Wilmington from time to time. I mean, there are people going back and forth to Great Britain, France, other places. They are bringing back arms. 
They are bringing back um, uh, rifle cannons, like famously the Whitworth guns that come through the blockade that are utilized at Gettysburg and can fire four to five miles produced over in Great Britain. But they're also bringing in high-end goods. Um, you remember the, the prices are going through the roof across the Southern Confederacy. Inflation is rampant. Um, but the rich still have money and they want to have the finest things in life. And the fastest way to make money is not to sell to the Confederate government, whose money is basically worthless. It's to sell to, to the common people who are the, the upper crust of society who actually have, have money. So they're bringing back uh, silks, they're bringing back dresses, they're bringing back um, you know, uh, dry goods, alcohol, anything else that they can. So it's the blockade runners. The blockade's effective, absolutely. I think the blockade runners where people think that they're bringing in so many supplies that they could supply a city, that's not the case. Uh, when they come into these places, it's usually under the cover of darkness as quickly as possible, and it's to offload high-end goods to make money because this is a high-risk, high-reward occupation. Um, and they're not going to do this to to just bring back the basic necessities of life. They're going to come back with the best of what they can. Um, and Mobile, like like I said, like Wilmington, uh, like Charleston and other places, have blockade runners, and it's high risk, high reward because as the war goes on, the U.S. Navy becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. The outset of the Civil War, there's about 92 ships in the U.S. Navy, but they're not all commissioned. Only about half of those are commissioned, and about half of those are even in American waters. So the U.S. Navy has to be built up, has to be called back to the home ports, and they're going to be using anything that is from civilian ships to new sloops of war uh, to the new ironclads will be down here to try to seal off these, these, um, these places. But Mobile, uh, famously, and there's a great book by Ben Raines, and I... I it's a little off topic for us. It's called The Last Slave Ship, and it's about the Clotilda. And it was uh, a ship that uh, went over to West Africa and brought back human cargo uh, on a bet, a $1,000 bet between two men in high society in Alabama. One said, I can go over there and bring back a bunch of slaves. And the international slave trade has been outlawed in the U.S. by this point by, for almost 60 years. And the other guy said, no, you can't do it. And the federal federal authorities in Mobile even knew they were going to try this. And they took a boat out, got to West Africa, enslaved a large number of people, and brought them back through Mobile right before the American Civil War started. Um, the federal authorities were looking for them. They scuttled the ship, but then sell off those people into, into slavery. Today, Africatown in Mobile is uh, largely was largely founded by the people who came off of that clotilda so if you ever have a chance i said ben rains is a fantastic speaker he's a local down here in the mobile area and he wrote a new york times bestseller called the last slave ship okay thanks for that great information there and uh, so as you said you know they're um you know high-end goods so who's profiting for is this going back into the confederate economy or is this going to selfish people that are just in it for themselves mostly in it for themselves um there are ships out there who are going to be basically what we think of as privateers for the Confederacy, um, trying to capture prizes here and there. Um, but the Confederate currency becomes so useless and worthless as the war goes on due to inflation um, that we're talking about people who maybe at the beginning of the war are going to bring back arms, munitions, anything they can for the Confederacy, realizing quickly that that's not going to um, that's not going to make them a profit. Um, and, you know, it's wartime. Uh, North and South, there are people profiteering off of this. This happens to this day um, uh, during war. And the Confederacy and the Union both, in their defense, try to fight against it. Um, you know, the, the stock stockpiling laws and different things they have here in Mobile try to fight against it, but it, it just doesn't work. Um, in fact, you know, the people of New Orleans or of Mobile um, came up with the idea for a self-imposed optional tax that they would just give money to the Confederacy, and it really never took off. Um, nobody likes to pay taxes, and uh, that that didn't take off. Um, so there is a spirit of patriotism for the North and the South in this area, obviously more for the South because of where it's located. Uh, but profiteering, unfortunately, is something that, that happens um, uh, you know, to this day. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, great point. Yeah. OK, let's go back to the Confederate defences. And you mentioned something really important there, and that is obviously the minefield or torpedo field, as it was called. Then. So would you like to explain a little bit about that and, and how that is going to, uh, yeah, just explain that for us? Yeah, so to, to jump forward uh, to 1864, the, the Union Army is employing what we call the Anaconda Plan. Um, it is what Winfield Scott had come up with in 1861. Everybody called him an old coot who didn't know what he was talking about. And then uh, he is going to uh, be kind of ushered out, and then everybody in 1864 is going to use the plan that Scott came up with, and that is to strangle the Confederacy and apply pressure at all points. And the Confederates know this, and they've been fortifying Mobile since 1861. Like I said earlier, they thought it was going to be uh, attacked. So Mobile Bay is an interesting – the mouth of it is, is interesting because um, the large seafaring ships that you would think that would end up in Mobile itself actually end up at Dauphin Island down near Port Morgan because the sandbar is so heavy uh, prior to the Civil War. They have to take lighter ships to take heavy cargo off of the seafaring ships over the spar at Dauphin Island and other places and at the docks of Dauphin Island and place them on smaller ships to come up to Mobile Bay. On the map that's on here, you can see the main shipping channel is uh, really very close to Fort Morgan and Mobile Point. I actually uh, utilized a 1940s aerial to show this. There's a fantastic uh, 1940s aerial of Fort Morgan that shows the sandbar from the air and shows you the the deep channel port. So they also know the Confederates do that Fort Gaines and Fort Morgan, their guns are not mutually supporting. The forts down here are so spread out and the communication is difficult and firing and, and support is difficult. So they're going to place any sort of obstructions that they can uh, across the mouth of the bay. And then they're going to utilize at one point 67 torpedoes, mines as we think of. They're basically large casks of black powder and there are a variety of different mines that are used throughout the war. Gabriel Rains is a Confederate general who's no, no, most notably known for coming up with these, these mines. Some of them are electrically charged that took down like the USS Cairo in 1862, in December of 62, out near Vicksburg. Um, here, this floating minefield, there's about 67 of them, and they have been placed here earlier in 1864 in these big kegs, and they have contact fuses on them. So if one of these ships, these Union ships that will come into the harbor, touches them, in theory, that will set off um, one of these mines. The problem is that the Confederates didn't realize is that the mines over time will start taking on water because they're not 100% watertight, and the black powder becomes damp, and the minefield, large portions of it were, were disarmed by Mother Nature. During our story here in a few minutes, we'll talk about the USS Tecumseh, which is taken down by one of these Confederate mines, which was almost by complete fluke that this thing went off. Um, and I'll explain why that, why I say that here as we get into the battle. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. And I want to jump back again also to each fort. And, you know, I know you probably, I know you did explain how many men was in each and, um, and that. But so what sort of guns are we talking about here? So Fort Morgan, yes, it's a, it's a fantastic fort. It's a masonry fort, low profile. If you're out on the water and you take the Mobile Ferry, it's very tough to pick out. Um, now, you have to remember that this was utilized by the U.S. Army after the American Civil War. It's used during the Spanish-American War, World War I, and World War II. So there are a lot of different additions to it. Like in the center of this fort today is a huge cement battery, part of what's called the Endicott system, and two 12.5-inch rifles would have been placed into there that, that were post-war guns. But in the bastions and in barbette, meaning firing over the top, you would have had, um, you know, 42-pounder howitzers. You would have had some rifle pieces. You would also have had a water battery down along the water. That's something that David Glasgow Farragut, the Union Navy commander here at the battle, um, is very worried about, this, these water batteries. Um, but the, the main issue is that it's Fort Morgan is just one fort and the range on the fort is not great enough to impact the U S Navy. And on top of it, at least not to a large extent. And on top of it, they do have Naval support, the Confederates, 
but they are uh, underpowered, um, outnumbered ships um, that just are <laughs> are going to turn into targets of their own. Um, so you have this static fort that once the Federals get past it, and once you run the guns of Morgan, you're stuck. Yeah, that's it. You're 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 basically once the, the Federal fleet is inside of Mobile Bay. It's a moot point to be inside of Fort Gaines, which is susceptible to a land attack more than it is a sea attack. And then Fort Morgan is susceptible to attack uh, coming in from the far east, and that's how the Union Army will will attack it. Uh, the last item that you showed there, this is Fort Gaines here, and you're looking at, um, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, that are in Barbette there, 42-pounder uh, howitzers, um, and, and each one of those bastions have them. The the last gun, this one is a um, Brook rifle that was created in Selma, Alabama. This is a typical Confederate naval gun, and this would have been the type of gun that would have been used by the Ram CSS Tennessee um, that's employed during the battle. The Brook rifle, it, it's a, a fantastically accurate gun. Um, it's just that there's not enough of them, and the Confederates just don't have enough ordnance to go around. Okay, so as far as manning these forts, is is this local people or is this, um, you know, from the Mobile area or were they obviously obviously part of the Confederate Army and just brought in from all over the place? At first, it's all Alabama troops. The first man to die at Fort Morgan is a guy who uh, gets drunk and drowns falling off of the dock at, at Fort Morgan in 1861. Um, but it, it, over time, you'll have more Confederate forces coming in from other parts of the Confederacy. A lot of these troops would have been pulled away um, in uh, early 1861 when they realized that the, the Confederates are not threatened in Mobile. Some of them are sent over to Braxton Bragg's troops in Pensacola. He's in charge of the Army of Pensacola over there. Um, and then later on, when the Shiloh campaign starts to heat up, and their troops are sent out in that direction from here. So over time, you would have... Um, the, the commanders in this area would be uh, Dabney Mari, uh, who's up in Mobile. He's a West Point class, I think, of 46. Um, you'd have Richard Page, who's a former... Um, U.S. Navy man himself, Charles Anderson, who was from South Carolina, went to Texas um, and is the first, I believe, Texan to be appointed to West Point, but drops out and then ends up commanding Fort Gaines that you see here. James Williams, he's in charge of uh, Fort Powell. Um, so what, what I'm saying here is we're not talking about the best and brightest of the Confederacy. Um, and one of the reasons is because Lee's army threatened in 1864. Other things have happened in Mobile. No offense to the city, but it was a backwater for much of the war. Um, since it's not being threatened, they're going to strip troops and strip things and send them to other parts of the Confederacy that are that are um, that need help. Yeah. So basically, they're undermanned, then, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, the, the Fort Morgan, the Citadel there, I think allegedly can hold about 600 um, troops. Fort Gaines can hold about 400-ish troops. You can see here, I mean, it's a tiny fort. This is this aerial yeah. here. Fort, fort Powell has uh, something like 140 men and I think 18 guns at the time. So, you know, you have a force multiplier uh, whenever you have a fortification. And traditionally speaking, military terms, you need – uh, three attackers to one defender in one of these places. And depending on the strength of the fort, you know, that force multiplier might be as high as four or five or six. Um, but you're looking here at this picture at the back side of the fort, and you might notice, yes, there are two rear bastions, one's cut off the, the right-hand side, but you'll notice that there's only small firing portals for rifles. And when the Union Army decides to attack your mobile, uh, they will land forces to the west of here and move inland forces towards this back wall, um, which kind of sits lower and <laughs> the Federals can almost fire down into the fort. And then um, they will send over um, some gunboats to fire into the fort itself. And there's actually some hits there. I think it's the Choctaw or Chickasaw that you can see that has um, impacts from that, from that battle that took place in August of 1864. Okay. OK, let's bring in some important people into the story now, obviously. So for the Union, we have um, Admiral uh, David Farragut and we have uh, Gordon Granger. So just give us a little bit background on these two guys and how they're going to end up um, taking charge of this offensive against Mobile. 
So uh, Farragut, uh, David Glasgow Farragut, Tennessee native. He's a lifelong um, uh, Navy, Navy man. He has really done well um, during the American Civil War. He's helped to take New Orleans. He has helped to seal off the Mississippi River. Because what happens, um, a very long story short, and I've been a little long-winded tonight, I apologize. The um, When New Orleans falls, Farragut wants to actually take his fleet and come over and take out Mobile, and that's April of 62. Uh, but what other people like Henry Halleck, Ulysses S. Grant, um, Abraham Lincoln think is more important is cutting off the Mississippi River. That'll be the spine of the Confederacy. So that's what they try to take out. So Farragut does a fantastic job fighting along the Mississippi River um, and, of course, taking New Orleans. And, and Farragut will be the naval, the uh, officer in charge of the naval forces who are taking on Mobile Bay. To the right is Gordon Granger. He's a West Point graduate, I think, of class of 1845. Gordon Granger um, has served well in the old army and has served well during the American Civil War, specifically during the Chickamauga-Chattanooga campaign. But he is not a favorite of Ulysses S. Grant, and Grant sends him to any backwater that he can find. Granger is serving under a man named Edward Camby, and Camby is charged with being the army side of this joint army navy operations and canby is going to turn over field operations to gordon granger but as he does so grant is now embroiled in july and august of 1864 in a siege around petersburg virginia and robert e lee has broken off a force under jubal early to go up the shenandoah valley or technically down the shenandoah valley towards washington dc and dc is being threatened so Troops are being stripped from the Deep South for the Federals, just like the Confederates had stripped men from the Deep South earlier in the war. And if you look at, like, the Army of the Shenandoah, when they're fighting in the Shenandoah Valley in 1864, part of their order of battle is men from the Army of the Gulf, because they have been called up there. So Granger initially is uh, given this task, and he's, he's you know, estimated he'll have about 5,000 men. He's going to have about half that number to come here um, to help support the the you the union um naval operations okay let's uh just uh bring bring up the confederate guys and as you said they're they're not great um but they haven't got a lot to use as you've already uh said as well so we have uh richard page and we have uh the naval commander franklin uh buchanan i believe is that right yeah, so Franklin Buchanan put 45 years into the U.S. Navy. He's a Baltimore, uh, Maryland native. Um, it, it, this, this is not to throw, throw shade that they're not great, but I mean, when you want, when you think about the American Civil War, you're not thinking about the men who are defending forts. Usually, you're thinking about the guys in the field leading bold attacks or defenses. Mm-hmm. Um, and Buchanan, you know, he's probably most famous for the action between the Monitor and the Merrimack, or the or the CSS Virginia, whatever you want to call it. And Buchanan um, is transferred down here in um, later on in the war into Mobile, and he has a small fleet, uh, if you want to call it that. Maybe a flotilla will be more accurate. And he'll have a, a handful of, of boats under his command. His flagship will be the CSS Tennessee, which is an ironclad ram, which was uh, built in Alabama, sent down to Mobile for its uh, fitting out and for its sea trials. Um, underpowered the ship that's just the kind of a <laughs> looks like a a big hunk of wood <laughs> sitting on top of a uh, on top of a raft and then richard page he also was in the navy um goes into the confederate service and becomes a brigadier general here in the, the confederate uh army um he's basically as operational command of fort morgan uh, he's also going to technically be the CO over Fort Gaines, which is close by, and of Fort Powell, uh, even though everything is over all command of, uh, of another general who's up closer to Mobile. But communication is a huge problem. Yeah, so how do they communicate? Have they got tele- telegraph lines down here at this point or not? Or are they just using people on horseback or... Yeah, up in up in Mobile itself, yes. Uh, yeah. But when we're when we're looking at these different fortifications, uh, there's not really telegraph wires strung between the two of them. Um, you could use signal flags, signal fires, things like that. Uh, the distance is just huge. Um, you know, there are telegraph wires used as uh, as trip wires as well as detonator wires for landmines up at Fort Blakely. 
um, mm. which is a whole other story, and that those come into play in April of 1865. Um, but this is communication is a huge problem with the bay of this this size and this nature. Yeah. And when you see it on the map, you can see see why. Uh, okay, so the Battle of Mobile Bay does uh, does start, and uh, basically, how does that unfold? And what is Farragut's plan to to uh, you know take take out these forts and take Mobile itself eventually? Uh, so the the idea is to have a flotilla of, of um, boats uh, out in the ships to come together. He's going to put together uh, a, an attack fleet of four Civil War era monitors. Uh, these are single and double turret um, boats. They're not really what we, you would want out in the deep ocean or into the, the Gulf of Mexico. And the um, USS Tecumseh showed up uh, just a few days before the battle. They, he puts them together here near Sand Point, as you can see. Um, he's going to uh, put together his main fleet out in the Gulf itself. He's going to anchor off the Gulf. And then he's going to do what the Federal Navy has done, the U.S. Navy has done up the Mississippi River, and he's going to lash larger ships with smaller ships. And the idea of what he has here is to, if one of the, uh, the ship's um, engines goes out, in theory, they can move both ships forward. And remember, a fleet's only as fast as its... As it's um, slowest ship so his idea is to maybe put these two together and move forward also his idea is to start moving his fleet from the gulf of mexico two by two and then the monitor class ships will swing in onto the starboard or the right hand side of the fleet they would interpose themselves between fort morgan and fort morgan's water batteries and act as a, uh, a shield of iron between the first, the, the second line of ships, and then the third line. So it'd be a first line of four monitors, and then you would have a larger ship as your second line. Um, the idea is to help protect smaller ships that would be on the port side. So he wants to, at about 545 in the morning, start moving his fleet towards the mouth of Mobile Bay. At the same time, he is going to send um, five ships up towards uh, Grants Pass and Fort Powell to seal off uh, that area and to bombard Fort Powell and keep keep that place subdued. And off of Mobile Point, he's also going to have a small flotilla of um, six or seven ships. And then uh, a few days prior, he had landed on Dauphin Island, his infantry force under Gordon Granger, to attack Fort Gaines from the rear. So the idea is to start moving at about 545 with his main fleet from the Gulf of Mexico up towards the mouth of Mobile Bay, run past the guns of Fort Morgan as fast as possible and try to get into the bay. The next thing he knows he has to contend with are the Confederate ships, the CSS Tennessee. Um, you have the CSS Selma, the CSS Gaines, the CSS Morgan, um, who are all here. Uh, waiting on the other side of Fort Morgan for whenever the U.S. Navy enters Mobile Bay. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there is a, I know you mentioned the torpedo uh, field there uh, earlier, and there's uh, something that happens, and that is the sinking of the Tecumseh. Um, and uh, I've, I managed to find this uh, fantastic, um, uh, well, I think the guy wrote in his diary or something like that, of, of something that happened during that uh, battle between the, the Tecumseh and, and, uh, and, no, sorry, it hit a minefield, didn't it? Yeah, so when he was clearing the minefield, wasn't it? So could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so what happens is uh, David Farragut's flagship under Percival Drayton uh, is the USS Hartford, and that is going to be the second sloop of war in line coming up towards Mobile Bay. In front of, of the Hartford will be two more ships, including the USS Brooklyn. And the Brooklyn, and I can't find the picture. I know it exists somewhere. It has this weird cow catcher looking thing on the front of it. And the reason the Brooklyn's in the front is because this cow catcher looking contraption is actually an anti-mine device. So it's supposed to be able to help clear this minefield. But unfortunately, the Brooklyn 
is not effective. And Captain Alden of the, the Brooklyn kind of slows the ship down and there's some problems. In the meantime, the USS Tecumseh is uh, a monitor class ship that has just joined the fleet uh, from Pensacola and uh, is going to be steaming off of uh, Mobile Point past the guns of Fort Morgan, the water batteries. And it took from about 545, uh, it took about an hour and a half for the fleet to really start making contact with Fort Morgan. So we're talking a slow moving fleet, probably doing about five knots would be my best estimate, given how slow the ships are. And the Tecumseh is in the lead. They're blasting away at Fort Morgan's water batteries when an explosion hits rocks underneath the ship. And they actually hit one of those torpedoes or one of those mines. Unfortunately for the Tecumseh, they actually hit one of the active mines. And this will make sense in a moment when I say it's an active mine. Because as, it, as they hit, this blows up. And on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, Daz, you have uh, a sketch by Alfred Wad. And this is showing Captain Craven of the um, USS Tecumseh. Tecumseh has about 100 sailors and officers on this ship. And when the torpedo exploded, the, it went off and breached the hull almost immediately. Water comes rushing in. And as uh, some men are trying to get out of the pilot house, the pilot, uh, I think his name is John Collins. Don't quote me on that. He uh, goes towards the ladder. And the captain, Craven, Commander Craven, says, after you, sir, um, or after you, Mr. Collins, there's a couple different uh, accounts of it. And he steps out of the way, and Collins starts to climb up the ladder. And as Collins looks back for his CO, his commanding officer, he sees that the uh, boat is filled with water and it's going down. Uh, so within, within just a few moments, 94 sailors have lost their lives on the USS Tecumseh. And it still sits at the bottom of Mobile Bay in about 30 feet of water. There's a naval buoy there that uh, marks the site of that, that war grave. Um, at the same time, Farragut is going to start making some decisions, and that is he's first off going to turn to the USS Meta Comet and have them move forward as quickly as possible to try to scoop up any of the survivors from the Tecumseh. In the meantime, uh, Farragut, and there's a few different accounts of this, Farragut is going to climb up into the rigging and uh, Percival Drayton the commander of the, the Hartford is going to tell one of the men, or one of the officers, hey, go tie up the boss because he's climbing into the rigging. Uh, Farragut turns back and says, no, 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 I'll be fine. And then climbs up into the rigging a second time and <laughs> says, you know, they're like, go tie the boss up a, a second time. And at this point, Farragut is going to scream something down. It's not damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. In fact, one of my friends, Jerry, in town says he thinks that they mean damn. The torpedoes. Jerry has a big, deep southern accent. Um, but he's going to say something along the lines of torpedoes, um, uh, four bells, Mr. Mr. Drayton. And uh, what that basically means is full speed ahead. Um, it's a great story. Regardless, he's going to give an order to, to move, move forward quickly. But in front of the Hartford is the Brooklyn. And when the Brooklyn sees the Tecumseh hit, the commander, Commander Alden of the, the Brooklyn's basically like, oh, man, I'm not in for this. I don't want to lose my, my sloop of war, which is more than 200 feet long. It has more than 300 sailors on it, even though it has this anti-mine device on the front. So Farragut, who's impatient, tells through signals the Brooklyn to get the hell out of the way. And he actually turns the Hartford out towards the torpedo field. And according to the sailors... They can hear the torpedoes scraping up against the side of the hull, and they're not detonating. So the one that the Tecumseh hit was an absolute fluke that took it down, unfortunately, for the men on that ship. But for the other ships, they talk about touching this field, and, and they knew it was there. But the torpedoes don't go off, and it's, again, probably just a fluke that took down the USS Tecumseh. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. I, 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 can't, I can hear them banging on the side of the ship as you was explaining that story then. Um, but yeah, again, you know, this is obviously something from like, a, you know, from, uh, I don't know, maybe the 1940s or something. That is the First World War. That is us. Oh, too. First World War, that's, sorry, uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure that one's our, our yeah. First World War, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, during the First World War, and especially the Second World War, George Washington, David Farragut, and others were... Uh, 
uh, used for war bonds and enlistment posters yeah. and everything else you could think of. And this actually shows up on a very similar one shows up on a stamp. And then I think Farragut shows up on two, two U.S. postal stamps. But again, it's that, it's that, um, it's great, great. Well, it's a little bit of fun, isn't it? Even though it wasn't funny. Um, but yeah, anyway, I know you did mention the USS Brooklyn there because they have a clash with the C, uh, uh, CSS Tennessee, don't they? So would you like to explain a little bit about that? <laughs> well, the entire fleet has a clash with the CSS uh, Yes, that's Tennessee. what I meant, yeah. But... <laughs> so when essentially, you know, the, the Battle of Mobile Bay is a very fast battle. Uh, by 8 o'clock in the morning, Farragut's fleet is in Mobile Bay, and Fort Gaines can't do anything off to the to the west. Fort Morgan's guns are basically out of range. The USS Meta Comet is ordered by Farragut to go chase down the CSS Selma, and they chase it down and capture it. The uh, uh, CSS Morgan says, I'm out of here, and they start heading off toward Bon Secours, and as they go off towards Safe Harbor, as it's known, um, they get caught on a piece of land, a, a sandbar, and <laughs> they're, they're grounded. Um, there's, uh, um, and then the Tennessee, which is an ironclad ram, and uh, meaning it does have armament on it. It does have brook rifles. It does have uh, some other some other things. This is a, a picture of it, I believe, in 1865. I mean, this thing looks like a kind of a cabin, a half baked cabin sitting on top of a big raft. <laughs> Um, and this is whenever it had been captured by the U.S. Navy. So uh, Franklin Buchanan, uh, you know, outgunned, outnumbered, he he goes for broke, and he takes the the CSS Tennessee and starts attacking the Federal fleet, and he tries to draw them a little bit deeper into Mobile Bay. Um, and as he does so, Farragut's men have broken through, um, and Farragut is basically going to take the the fleet. And he is going to surround the CSS Tennessee. He is then going to take his ships, first the Lackawanna, then the Mon Monongahela, then the Hartford itself, and start ramming the ram. Because ramming is an ancient, ancient form of naval warfare. Well, the Lackawanna doesn't do anything to it. The Monongahela doesn't do anything to it. The Hartford glances off because Buchanan had the ship turn before it, it actually uh, hits. Uh, then the Lackawanna tries to come at the Tennessee again and runs into the Hartford. So we have U.S. Navy ships running into U.S. Navy ships. And over time, the Federals roll up right to these guns. And uh, according, I think it's Farragut's official report. I think it's his. He said that um, he rolled his his nine inch Dahlgren gun up to the to the the. Uh, starboard side of the ship and on top of 30 pounds of black powder at 12 feet fired into the side of the ship so they are just blasting away at point blank range um and over time the smokestacks knocked off the steering chains are knocked out uh franklin buchanan has his leg broken during this action i believe don't quote me he's leaning up against the bulkhead when it's hit um by a by a shell um the portholes are being shot out of the um, – are, are being blocked because they're being shot out of the Tennessee. And the, uh, the, the Brook rifle that was inside of this thing that was created in Selma, it was actually on a, an ingenious uh, carriage that could be pulled back, turned port or starboard, and fired. And the Confederates do this for a lot of their, their different rams like the Jackson and the uh, Albemarle and, and the Tennessee here. But over time, the Federals just – pound this thing relentlessly from all sides it's like a pack of wolves and what you're seeing here the last picture this was under the u.s flag and here's the css tennessee under the american flag too buchanan has to give up the ship and uh he surrenders the tennessee to the united states navy and it is taken as a prize of war by them and then re-outfitted and brought back to help bombard Fort Morgan later on <laughs> in this in this campaign. Um, so the pictures and sketches we have of this thing is mostly from the Union side. In fact, the U.S. Naval Heritage Command has a sketch of the CSS Tennessee, which is, says USS Tennessee, formerly CSS Tennessee. Hmm. Um, so almost everything comes from that. Because at this point of the war, Confederate photographers are out of chemicals. Those are not coming through from the blockade. 
Um, so all of the pictures we have from the Battle of Mobile Bay are post-battle pictures, and they're taken by U.S. photographers. Yes, exactly. And I just cannot imagine what he must have been thinking inside that vessel when he saw all of those uh, uh, boats coming towards him. And, of course, when they're being pounded as well, it's just crazy. Um, but you're going to give up on you straight away, no doubt about it. Um, I mean, he's he's outnumbered. I mean, they're, they're bringing in everything from sloops of war. There are monitors out here. Um, you have uh, smaller ships. I mean, he's hitting them with everything he has. He's ramming into him. Farragut's running into Buchanan's guys. But the one thing that, that stuck out to me, well, there's two things quickly uh, that stuck out to me. Number one, when he when Farragut submits his first official report for this battle, he'll put in two bit different reports. He reports 88 sailors wounded, 41 dead, I believe. I'm doing this off the top of my head. But he doesn't include the Tecumseh as part of the casualty list um, whenever this battle takes place. But the other thing that stuck out to me uh, reading his his post-battle uh, reports is how much the monitor-class boats were terrible. Uh, they didn't steer properly. They were underpowered. And a lot of times the turrets would not um, either move or they, they got the moving so quickly that they had to fire on the fly. And Farragut complains about the, Fer- the monitor-class ships. Um, they definitely helped him win the Battle of Mobile Bay, but in the end, they were not this perfect weapon like I think some people make them out to be. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's technically the um, the uh, the naval side of it sort of wrapped up, but it carries on as a siege, does it, for quite some time. So h- how long do the Confederates last in these forts, and what's, what's the <laughs> Union response to this? Because they're going to get bombarded, aren't they? You know what I mean? So I'm laughing because the Confederates, um, it's not the, the Confederate defenders, I'm not laughing at, at them, it's the Confederate high command fighting with one another about how long they should stay. So this this is probably one of the most famous images of the Battle of Mobile Bay. To the left is Fort Morgan. You can see its lighthouse, you can see its water batteries, and then you can see um, the, the uh, masonry fort itself. And then on the left-hand side, you can see the CSS Tennessee, the Gaines, and the Morgan. The, the CSS naval ships. On the right-hand side, you can see um, the, the sandbar out in the distance, but you can also see the Tecumseh being felled by that, that torpedo, the monitor-class ships firing at the water batteries, and then the rest of the fleet firing. Um, is there rolling past? I mean, they just keep firing. There's not stopping. They keep going. So what happens is, in a nutshell, um, the U.S. Navy makes it into Mobile Bay and starts sending ships up towards um, up towards Fort Powell. One of the ships that goes up there is the USS Chickasaw. The Chickasaw comes in from the backside of Fort Powell, and then on the front, there are five more ships. So Fort Powell's kind of stuck in the middle. They're on the right flank. They're the closest to Mobile Bay, and their commander, James Williams, has 18 guns and about 140 men. He is just like, this is crazy. I'm not staying here. Um, he can't get word of what he should do from his commanding officers, even though they said hold to the last. He gives up this. He gives up the fort um, within the the first day of the battle. Um, now we say Mobile Bay took place from April, August second, excuse me, roughly to August twenty third, eighteen sixty four. But the actions, most of the actions, took place on August fifth, and then at the very end on August twenty third. Um, so Fort Powell is given up, and then to make it even better, William blows up the fort uh, when he leaves. Uh, spectacular explosion. Largest explosion in Mobile until May of 1865 when another one blows up. Yep, there it is. It's, it says July 5th, 1864. It should say August. Uh, but that's, that's it blowing up into the air. Fort Gaines is now going to come under the fire of the United States Navy as well as the U.S. Army. Uh, Gordon Granger moves in from the west to east, comes into the backside of the fort, the most indefensible part of the fort, and then slipping in around the around the northern part of the fort will be the USS Chickasaw. They will start lobbing shells into there, and Charles Anderson, who's in charge of Fort Gaines, is like, you know what? I'm out. This, is, this isn't for me. Um, so the fights there aren't really what I would call fights. I mean, these, these guys put up a half-hearted effort at most. The, we have to be fair, though. The U.S. Navy commands the waters. And we're not talking about whenever you go to a Civil War battlefield, 12-pound Napoleon firing at you, a three-inch three ordnance rifle, which is scary enough. 
when we're talking about naval ordnance coming in on you, those are some big old shells. Um, so that that's going to happen there. Uh, so Charles Anderson, he gives up, <laughs> gives up Fort Gaines. Next is going to be Fort Morgan. Now, they know that Fort Morgan's going to be a tough nut to crack. The U.S. Army built the place. They know it really well. What you're looking at here is the interior citadel that I told you about. But on the top left corner, you can see the casemates for the actual outer fort. Um, and you can see the top of the bastion leading out of the scarp and counter scarp. Um, so this is what it looks like after the U.S. Navy has bombarded and the U.S. Army have bombarded this for about two and a half weeks. Um, Gordon Granger's troops will be taken from Dauphin Island. They'll be moved to the east over to uh, Gulf Shores on Mobile Point and landed somewhere around four miles to the east of Fort Morgan. Fort Morgan's guns can't touch them. That means that Fort Morgan is now going to come under siege operations, like we would see at um, Morris Island in 1863 after the famous attack of the 54th Massachusetts. They just the U.S. Army starts doing siege operations. Then the same thing will happen at Fort Pulaski in, in 1862. Uh, so Gordon Granger just does the old ancient uh, ancient warfare and and starts doing a siege and starts setting up parallels, moving closer and closer. Richard Page, who's in charge of the fort down here, is going to complain that the other two forts gave up without a fight, really, and thinks that those guys should be, be basically run out of the Confederate Army. But Page is now in the same position his subordinates were in. Uh, he, he has the U.S. Navy bombarding him at will. He has the U.S. Army coming in from one side, the Navy's on the other side, and um, supplies are going to start running low because this is going to turn into a siege. Um, there are cows wandering through the scarp and then through the dry moat uh, and other animals. They all have to be brought in. And I think it's something like 80,000 pounds of black powder are sitting inside of Fort Morgan. So he's worried um, that if this thing goes up, it will go up like a tinderbox. So on August 23rd, the U.S. Uh, Army and Navy close in on Fort Morgan. And as basically the main assault is about to take place, Richard Page gives up the gives up the the fort and surrenders. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the damage that you see here, and most of the casualties from the battle, are either from the naval action that took place on the fifth, the bombardment that took place over the next two and a half or so weeks, and then for the Confederates especially, um, whenever the garrisons at Fort Morgan, Fort Gaines. Whenever they surrender, um, that's where your casualty list will start to grow um, as, as uh, you know, mostly surrendered troops. Um, and by August 23rd, the Battle of Mobile Bay is, is over. Uh, the siege, if you will, of Mobile Bay, which is really the siege of Fort Morgan, is over. Um, and the U.S. Navy holds Mobile, uh, Mobile Bay. What's important to remember is that, yes, they have now taken out Fort Powell, They've taken out Fort Gaines, and they've taken out Fort Morgan. They basically have an unbroken string of forts from Pensacola over to Mobile, over to Fort Massachusetts, over to New Orleans and along the Mississippi River. But Mobile doesn't fall. Mobile falls on April 12th of 1865 um, because there's nothing really of value in in taking Mobile at this point. They don't have the infantry forces, the Federals, to go and take it, and they're sailed off from the rest of the world. Selma is producing arms and armament to send off to, to the Confederacy. Mobile doesn't have the major industry that other parts of the Deep South do. Um, so the city itself is pretty much left alone. And, uh, you know, whenever you hear those tales of the Union Army destroying every southern city, which is not true, um, Mobile has really spared the hard hand of war. Mm -hmm. And so does this have any effect at all on the Confederacy's ability to carry on fighting the war in other other uh, campaigns? I mean, it, I, it, it, it benefits the Federals more than it benefits the Confederates. Um, I, to me, this is just the icing on the cake. Mobile Bay uh, had to deal with the Gulf blockading squadrons and uh, the, anyone running in and out of there. So it, it had been not been a, a, an active port really since the, the war started. It had been, you know, um, the importance of that port has kind of waned because of the, 
the Confederacy's self-imposed embargo and some other items. Um, so in the, in the long run, uh, when it comes to morale, you would think that it would hit it, but Gary Gallagher did a really nice uh, essay, I don't know what it was, God, it was 20 years ago now, um, about the Southern will. And uh, it's to sum it up, you know, he would say, okay, New Orleans fell, but that's okay. We still have these things. And then Charleston, or I'm sorry, Savannah falls. That's okay. We still have that. Mobile falls. We still have that. There's always this, this idea that if Lee's armies in the field or their field armies are out there, they could still win. And that's the center of gravity, as Klaus Fitz would call it, within the, the Confederate army. Um, you know, it, it's important, I think, for the people of Mobile that, that uh, the bay is cut off because it's cut off their commerce, um, the food supplies, and it's cut off the, them from the rest of the world. But in the grander scheme of the Confederate war effort in late 1864, this is just another port checked off the list um, as Grant's armies and navies get closer to victory. Um, on the Union side, I think it's more important. It's morale boosting after the fact that you've had this bloodbath that was the overland campaign. Um, now we can turn to Mobile and say, hey, look at this great victory. But And, and this isn't any throwing any shade at any of the guys who fought at Mobile or the importance of this. Uh, but I think it is a, little, a bit overhyped on the Union side, uh, this victory. Um, I think the, the blockading squadrons have been doing a good job down here. I think that this is just the, you know, kind of that, that ribbon that ties up that bow. Um, but it, 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 it's big for the U.S. Navy. I mean, it's, it's a morale boost for them, for sure. I mean, look at another Southern port that we won. And, of course, as Lincoln's coming closer to that 1864 election, and every battle's political because it's getting you towards your strategic end. Um, it's very important from that perspective. As it comes to the nuts and bolts of the American Civil War, logistically speaking, I don't think it's, it's as important as it sometimes is, is blown up to be. But I think from a morale standpoint, especially for the Northern people in an election year and in, in a summer that has turned into a bloodbath right after Washington has come under the guns of Jubal early, this is a victory that was desperately needed, as small as it was or as large as it was for the Lincoln administration. Yeah. Great points. Absolutely great points. Um, okay, so um, a couple of years ago, or was it a year ago now, um, you guys went and visited the sites for American Battlefield Trust, but how accessible are, and I know there's only two forts you can visit now, isn't there? Um, but how accessible are these places? I love Mobile. I'm a, um, I'm an adopted Mobilian, uh, according to my friends down there, because I spend a lot of time there. I'll be there later this year. We'll have an event there again next year with the Trust. Gary and I will be, Gary Edelman and I will be leading tours through here. Um, Melinda, who oversees Fort Gaines, uh, she's just a gem. She's, she's very welcoming to us. Uh, Fort Gaines uh, was on the most endangered list for a while. The American Battlefield Trust helped to preserve uh, some land down here, and Fort Gaines is at the very uh, is at the very tip of Dauphin Island. It's actually beside a Naval Research Center uh, or Marine Research Center and, and some other stuff. So you can get right out to it. Uh, go in. You can access it. it. Has a ten seat latrine that you could go and sit on. Chris Mikowski and Gary and I on. Uh, sat right, on that. Right there. there you go. Yep. There's three <laughs> idiots sitting on the latrine. But my favorite part about this is that this was part of the outer defenses uh, or the inner defenses of the fort, and there are firing portals through here. So if somebody had to defend this part of the fort, um, so it's accessible. It's great. I, I love it. Um, you could take the, and I suggest this, take the the ferry from Gaines over to Fort Morgan. Um, it's a car ferry, but if you have a bicycle or if you're just on your foot, you can take that as well. It's about a four mile. Uh, ride. Uh, it takes about a half hour ish to get across. Um, it gives you a great perspective of the forts. I love it because it gives you that water view. Um, and these things are really hard to pick out along the the the, uh, the shoreline. Fort Morgan is uh, overseen by the state of Alabama. Um, they have done a lot of work recently because they were hit by a hurricane. But if you go to to Fort uh, Morgan. The visitor center is designed to look like the old citadel that would have sat inside of the fort. Um, and then you can go right inside of the fort. The Sally Port's there. I think you showed a picture of it uh, with the Morgan uh, keystone above it for Daniel Morgan. You go inside of it. Battery du Portail is inside of it, which is the um, uh, Endicott battery that was placed there for the Spanish-American War era. 
Um, the uh, the forge is in remarkably good shape for how, how old it is. Absolutely worth your time. And there are some other places to go to. Um, I think it's the Sons of Confederate Veterans oversee a small piece of land up in Spanish Fort, which is about, um, uh, as the crow flies, about 30 miles north of Fort Morgan. And then just above that, above Bayman and it, is uh, Fort Blakely, where the trust has done a lot of work. And Fort Blakely State Park is well worth your time to go out there. It's a, a ghost town, and it was uh, at 1.9 miles of Confederate trenches. It is the last great charge of the American Civil War. It took place the same day as Lee's army surrendering to Appomattox and then led to the fall of Mobile on April 12th of 1865. So there's a lot of history down here. The best way to see it is by car because Mobile Bay is massive. I cannot underestimate, I, I cannot, you can't underestimate just how big this place is. If you start off in Mobile and you're going to drive down to Fort Gaines, it can take you on a busy day uh, up to an hour. If you have to go from Fort Gaines all the way around the bay, up along Gulf Shores to Fort Morgan. It could take you about two and a half hours to do that. So taking the ferry is a great way to do it. Um, but it, it, this, these are places that are well worth your time and well worth uh, a, a visit if you're ever in the Mobile area. Awesome. And also, um, other things go on in Mobile, and uh, that is a lot of drinking. <laughs> Um. <laughs> well, this is uh, Chris Mikowski. Uh, the the center picture here, Chris Mikowski. I mean, he's a he's a historian with a real drinking problem, and that's an inside <laughs> joke with us. Um, we, a, anytime we go out to have a meal, Chris gets a drink, and then we send a picture to Gary Edelman's wife, who thinks that he has a drinking problem because we we show him drinking all the time. But in the center, that's Chris in New Orleans. After we filmed in 2023 at Mobile, we drove over to New Orleans for another video shoot. Um, so that's him enjoying a hurricane. Off to the right, historically speaking, that's us at uh, near Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Oh, okay, Hard Rock Cafe. <laughs> then on the left is Chris Bukowski drinking on the Wilderness Battlefield uh, uh -huh. during our Chancellorsville 160 filming. Um, I also have him in the Sobrero in that one. Uh, I have a few pictures of Chris and Sabrina. You, you do, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a new one that I have that I didn't send over I to you. But, uh, that, that's our tradition. But Mobile has a fantastic food scene. Um, the historic city market um, is still there. It's the it's the history center. It was once the government. Um, it, it was the government offices. The city market's there. Fort Condi is there that you can go and, and visit. Um the, the city's founded in 1703, um, and it's uh, they have a Mardi Gras museum. There's a big fight between New Orleans and, Mar and um, Mobile about who came up with Mardi Gras. I say Mobile since I'm an adopted Mobilian, um, mm -hmm. but the people in New Orleans claim it's them. Um, so it, it's a city with a lot of charm, and I think it's on New Year's they drop a big moon pie um, for their – they don't have a ball down there like they do in, in Times Square. They have a moon pie that they drop from the tallest building between Florida and Texas along the Gulf Coast. Awesome. It sounds amazing. I definitely want to go now. Um, but um, one last thing to before we wrap up, and that is the American Battlefield Trust videos you did uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago. Um, and again, they're fantastic. And so I'm just, you know, you know, encouraging people to go and watch these, subscribe, like, share with your friends and all that stuff. And uh, so, yeah, Chris, how, how fun was that to do those? It was a lot of fun. It was a lot. It was very quick. We were actually in the middle of, of filming another project over in, in New Orleans. Um, so we had just held our teacher institute here in Mobile a few months prior. Um, and so we didn't have time to film. So we came down here, it was just me, Gary and, and Chris. And we, just, um, we could not take the ferry for some, we missed the ferry, um, at one point. Uh, so we had to take that long drive around and, um, so we ended up at Fort Morgan, which is on the left, and Fort Gaines, which is on the right. And Fort Gaines actually has a has a piece of the USS Hartford. It has one of its anchors. Um, I believe it's 1956 while in dock in um, Norfolk Naval Yard. The whole ship just collapses. And so you can find pieces of the Hartford in about two, almost two dozen places around the U.S. There's a cannon here. There's an anchor there. Um, there's a, a boat from it, one of the launches at the National uh, Civil War Naval Museum in Columbus, Georgia, which is well worth your time. They have a recreation of, of the, uh, the Hartford there that you can walk through part of it, um, and, and that's a really neat one. So we had a blast. 
Um, and then, of course, ended up in New Orleans, and Mikowski ended up with a, uh, with a hurricane in his mouth every other minute. So the videos are available in the podcast description, and so go and watch them. And all that's left to say is thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you, Daz, uh, and to everybody for listening. Sorry we didn't get to the battle a little bit sooner, but I find uh, Mobile's history just fascinating, especially the, the, the Alabama's history in general. It's a, it's a really interesting state, and um, check out their archives channel over on YouTube, and you can learn a lot about uh, Mobile's history, and almost everything that I have learned are from local Mobilians who have turned into historians like John Sledge and Mike Bunn and Paul Bresky and, and others. Um, there are a lot of great assets out there that are going to teach you more about this battle and other actions around Alabama.